morning, everyone, or good, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon or evening, depending on what part of the world you may be in. Um, my name is Lorraine Maines. I'm the Associate Dean for Research here at the Kelly School of Business. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to Indiana University, to the Kelly School, and to the Revitalized Institute uh, for Corporate Governance. We at Kelly have had an Institute for Corporate Governance for many years that has served a number of different purposes, but I'm very pleased to say that it has been revitalized under the directorship of Professor Jun Yang as a research center. And our focus really is um, not just to enhance collaborations among the faculty uh, and doctoral students here at the Kelly School who are interested in corporate governance. And we have faculty across almost all of our departments from accounting to business law, to management, to finance, you name it, um, who do research on corporate governance. But we also want to help connect scholars and other people who are interested in corporate governance together across the world. So we welcome you all and, and hope you um, enjoy being part of the Kelly School's um, Institute for Corporate Governance. Our purpose mainly is to focus on um, advancing research. We want to advance theory, help build um, the body of empirical knowledge on corporate governance with the idea that we're going to help inform policy debates and influence practice. So we do have a practical bent to our focus as well. I am very excited along with everybody else here at the Kelly School that we're going to start this revitalized institute with a series of talks and, and um, speeches by some of the leading scholars in the area of corporate governance. And I'm particularly thrilled uh, that Alex Edmonds is from LBS is going to lead off this series uh, today. I wanna take a minute to thank our, our two partners um, in this uh, lecture series. The first being the European Corporate Governance Institute and the other being the Ostrom Workshop here at Indiana University. So thanks to both of our partners. We look forward to uh, working with you on this. I also wanna take a moment to thank June Yang. Um, about, I think it was about a year ago, I asked June, you know, would she be interested in willing in leading the uh, Institute? And she immediately said yes. And since then, she has been tireless in her um, efforts to, to come to where we are today. So it's, it's her vision, it's her connections, it's her guidance, it's her literally tireless effort, because as I said, on top of it, she's now co-chair of finance. So I know she doesn't sleep these days. Um, so thank you, June. You'll be hearing from her um, after Alex finishes his talk. Um, she'll give you a little heads up about some things that are coming in the future. At this point, I want to introduce another colleague of mine, Phil Cochran, um, who's a professor of management and the former Executive Associate Dean for Faculty and Research at our Indianapolis campus. So he will introduce our speaker for today. So I'll turn it over to you, Phil. Thanks, Lorraine. Uh, it's my privilege to uh, introduce uh, Alex Edmonds. I've been following Alex's work for a number of years since I work in the, in the similar area. And uh, I will give you a, a, an abridged version of his, uh, his bio here. The full version might take the full length of his talk. But uh, Alex is a professor of finance at uh, London Business School, academic director of the Center for Corporate Governance. He graduated from Oxford University, uh, worked for Morgan Stanley, got his PhD from MIT Sloan School, uh, joined the Wharton School where he got tenure and then he went to LBS. His uh, work has been cited in, in Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, New York Times, The Economist, CNN, ESPN, ITV, NPR, and a host of other uh, publications. Uh, he has spoken at the uh, World Economic Forum in Davos. Uh, he has uh, given a TED Talks, which have uh, been seen over 2.3 million times. He serves as a director of the steering group for the Purposeful Company. Uh, his uh, 
2021 lecture series on the psychology of finance and uh, prior series on uh, business skills of the 21st century and how business can better serve society. We've been highly cited. Uh, his recent book, re great book, uh, How to Grow, Grow the Pie, How Great Companies Deliver Both Purpose and Profit was named to the Financial Times uh, Best Books of 2020. Uh, he's won uh, 14 uh, teaching awards in six years at LBS. He won the Best Teacher Awards for both the MBA and Masters in Financial Analysis. So with that, let me turn it over to Alex. Well, thanks so much, Phil. It's great to be here. I really appreciate the invitation and huge congratulations for the resurrection of the centre. And thank you also to the ECGI and the Austrian Workshop for this partnership. And uh, thanks to everybody for attending. It's great to just to look at through the attendee list and see a lot of great scholars and practitioners um, willing to hear my thoughts on this really important issue. So what I'm going to speak about today is ESG. Do we need it? And does it work? And the first part of my question might seem to be bizarre, right? Doesn't, shouldn't everybody agree that ESG is absolutely necessary? This seems to be the question of the time. So it seems pretty strange to even question whether we need this premise. And to examine this question, let's look at what a world without ESG would look like. And to do this, let's go to the person who seemed to be the most anti-ESG figure, who is Milton Friedman. So what Milton Friedman argued is that the social responsibility of business is to increase its profit. So if we did not have ESG, we would have companies focusing entirely on making profits. And then he goes on to say what this indeed entails. It involves focusing totally on making money and forgetting about any concerns for employees, customers or society. We clearly don't want to live in that world. That's why ESG is so urgent. Hang on a moment. Milton Friedman did not actually ever say this. This was a quote from Steve Denning of Forbes, who was paraphrasing what Milton Friedman said. But I went back to reading Milton Friedman's article many, many times, and I did not see anywhere in that article where he argued that a company focusing on profits should indeed not care about employees, customs or society. In fact, when I read Friedman, he was arguing the opposite. So what he said is that it may well be in the long run interest of a company to invest in the community and to improve its government. And that would help a company because ultimately it might be able to attract the best employees. So that is why Milton Friedman argued that a company could focus on profits alone, because as long as you define those profits as long term profits, by pursuing long term profits, that will force you to care about society. You need to treat your workers well, or they'll leave. You can't pollute the environment, or your brand will be hurt. And you need to satisfy customer demands, otherwise they will walk away. Now, some people might accept the last thing that I said, but then they might argue, well, the pursuit of profit will lead you to exploiting every single loophole and going as far as you can without breaking the law in your pursuit of profit. But again, Milton Friedman did not advocate that either. Right, he argued that not only do you need to obey the law, but you also need to obey rules of society embodied in ethical custom. And he said it's not only for that you need to avoid, you also need to avoid deception. So actually, given this, you might question, do we even need ESG? Or as long as we define profits as long-term profits, is it enough for a company to focus on long-term profits while obeying the law and also obeying the morals of the time? And to highlight this view, let's look at what people think a world with ESG would look like. So this is the business roundtable statement, which was made two years ago. This is that a company to serve wider society needs to care about all of its stakeholders. But everything here is pretty much consistent with Milton Friedman. As long as you are a long term company, you would want to deliver value to your customers and invest in your employees and deal fairly and ethically with your suppliers. And similarly, Larry Fink, who is one of the big proponents of ESG, he writes a letter to CEOs every year. His most recent one says, the more your company can show its purpose in delivering value to its customers, employees and communities, the better able you will be able to deliver long term durable profits for shareholders. But again, that's not necessarily an ESG statement. That's a Milton Friedman statement, because if your goal is long term profits, 
you will be going after all of those things. So the big question that I want to ask today, is ESG any different from being simply long-term? And indeed, a common synonym for ESG is sustainability, but sustainability is itself pretty much a synonym for long-term. So can we just stick with the shareholder value model that we've taught in business schools for the last 50 years, as long as we emphasize the word long-term? And I would say, actually, no. So I do believe there is something fundamentally different about being a company that pursues ESG than simply being long-term. And this is because I believe there's three important assumptions that Friedman makes that aren't satisfied in the real world. And so this is something I wrote about in an article called What Stakeholder Capitalism Can Learn from Milton Friedman. And what I emphasize is that we often think about Friedman as being a doctrine. He said a company should only focus on profits, but instead I'd like to see it as a theorem. And you might think, well, what's the difference? Both of them seem pretty academically worse. But what is a theorem? Most of us will know the Midigliani Miller theorem, right? That says that under certain conditions, the capital structure of a company has no effect on firm value. Now, in reality, those conditions don't hold, right? We do have taxes, we have market imperfections and so on. But the value of Medigliani Miller, and this is why it's still taught in 2021, is that only if those assumptions are violated should we try to think about changing capital structure. So capital structure matters, but not because of things like debt is cheaper than equity, it matters because of things like tax shields and information asymmetry. And then similarly, in terms of Friedman, he said that under certain conditions, a company should just focus on long-term profits. In reality, those conditions are not always satisfied, and that's why I'm still a big advocate for ESG. But I still think it's a useful starting point, because unless those conditions are violated, it is fine to focus on long-term profits. So let me explore what I think those three conditions are. The first important condition is the idea that serving society is zero-sum. So what Milton Friedman argues is he considers charitable donations. And the issue with charitable donations is it is zero sum. So if a company gives $1 to a charity, that's $1 taken away from shareholders. So he argues, well, why should a company give to charity? It should instead just give that as greater dividends to shareholders, and then shareholders can choose what charities to support. So no value is actively being created through charitable donations. However, why this is an assumption which is not always satisfied is there are many social actions where companies have a comparative advantage, where they create far more than $1 of social value by serving society. For example, if a company chooses to reduce its plastic packaging, that could have way more effect on the environment than if it was to not make that investment, give it to shareholders, and then shareholders donated to Greenpeace to lobby for a tax on plastic packaging. So this is why I do believe ESG is important. If you focus on areas where you have comparative advantage, you can create value. But where Friedman is important and where Friedman is still useful is that unless you have comparative advantage, maybe you should not engage in ESG. And I think this is striking because there are many companies who associate ESG with charity or who think that to do ESG, we need to be all things to all people, try to tick every single box. When in fact, a company which is truly responsible will focus on the subset of issues where it believes it has unique expertise. So that's one case in which Milton Friedman fails, but sometimes his assumptions do hold. The second thing he argues is that government intervention is effective. So Milton Friedman is, uh, was completely upfront that an economy cares about things far more than just financial value. But he said that governments are best placed to evaluate those social objectives. For example, there's a big challenge right now on the massive importance of decarbonisation. However, like if you do decarbonize, there are some consequences of that. You might make a lot of blue collar workers out of jobs. And so when the government decides that trade off, 
the government will follow the preferences of the electorate, where each person has one vote, and they will vote for a government which best reflects the aggregate preferences of the nation. Now, in contrast, if we have investors playing government by pursuing ESG policies, the problem is that investors may only represent the 1%, the elites, maybe they're not representing the blue collar workers who will be out of jobs if we have too rapid decarbonisation, and therefore they're not actually going to be serving society. So Friedman's argument is that the government should decide social objectives, not companies or investors, because it's far more democratic. But where Friedman fails is that there are many factors that are difficult to regulate. But you can regulate minimum wages, you can regulate things like taxes to curb inequality, but you can't regulate things like working conditions, meaningful work, skills development, a psychologically safe corporate culture, and those things. And therefore, that's why investors have a responsibility and the prerogative to step in and hold companies to account for those ESG factors. Why right? it could be that the population of a country genuinely cares about those issues, but we don't have laws about them because the laws could never prosecute a company for a bad culture to begin with, and therefore there is a role for ESG. But again, I think that Freeman offers a useful starting point, because before companies and investors think about ESG, they have to first think, is there a government failure? Because there might be certain areas where there is no government failure. For example, let's go back to inequality. Now, one argument that some people have about lowering CEO pay is that if you pay the CEO too much, then that's something which is going to lead to income inequality. But my view, which maybe not everybody will agree with, but my view is that as long as the CEO has justified her pay with sustainable long-term performance to both shareholders and society, she deserves high pay. Now, that might indeed contribute to inequality, but we do have a useful tool to address inequality, which is the tax system. And because the government has a tool to address inequality, I do think that should be left to the government because the electorate has different preferences on inequality. Some people think it's OK, others don't, but that is a government issue. But the third thing I'm going to focus on, which is the most important thing for my talk, is that Friedman argues that shareholder value can be maximised instrumentally. What do I mean by this? So remember Friedman said we should focus on long-term profits, and as long as we define profits as long-term, we will make many investments. Now, how do finance professors like me argue we should make investments? We do an instrumental calculation of what we can benefit from that investment. If we build a new factory, how many widgets will that factory produce? How much can we sell this for? And is this worth the cost? And if it is, we're going to go ahead and build the factory. However, for ESG investments, it's really hard to do an instrumental calculation, right? So let's think about a company which is deciding, do we give more parental leave to our employees? Now, if we do that, then employees might be more motivated and more productive, but you have no idea of what the cash flow implications of that will be. You can't even do an NPV because it's really difficult to try to figure out what are the shareholder value benefits of improving parental leave policy. And so this is where I think ESG is really powerful, is it allows you to take an intrinsic approach, is that we're going to invest in our stakeholders because we think it's the right thing to do. And this might free us to take some investments which ultimately do end up improving shareholder value, but we could have never forecast those benefits from the outset. An analogy is here is some of the research in organizational behavior on pro-social behavior. Like probably in your lives, you have some colleagues or friends who are genuinely nice people who will always help. And then there's others who are more calculated people. They will help you if they think they can expect something in return. And what research suggests is actually the first set of people end up being more successful because they might help somebody purely out of generosity, but later on in unexpected ways, they might have the favor returned down the line. So this is the power of the ESG approach. If we do things for instrumental value, they might ultimately pay off in ways that we did not predict. 
So in order to do to talk, think about ESG having value, I've said why, why it is something which is beyond just being long term. But let me now just give an example of that, because so far I've talked in terms of hypotheticals and principles. So what do I believe ESG is? So let me tell you a little bit of a story. Let me take you back to March 2020 in the UK. And in the UK, Prime Minister Boris Johnson launched something known as the Ventilator Challenge. He challenged companies that makes have used to make things like vacuum cleaners to start making ventilators to save a lot of lives. That sounds fantastic. However, the big problem was that in the National Health Service, there were just not enough qualified staff to operate these ventilators because of years of underinvestment. However, there were some consultants from Imperial Co from University College London who remembered that back in the 1990s, they used to do something called continuous positive airway pressure on a device known as the Whisper Flow, which looked a bit like this. And so they thought, well, if we could just go back in time for 30 years and then reverse engineer the Whisper Flow and bring it forward to 2020, maybe we could save some lives. Why? Because the Whisper Flow was a pretty simple machine and you did not need trained staff to operate it. But the big problem was that the whisper flow was a 30 year old device. You could not even get hold of this. Indeed, the only way that they were able to get hold of it is they went down to the UCL museum and they picked out the whisper flow in this old museum. So having got this, they thought, well, how can we mass produce it? Well, UCL decided to put together the might of their healthcare engineering, the mechanical engineering and their hospital but what they also needed was a company. And this company was Mercedes. Specifically Mercedes powertrains, that's the part of Mercedes that makes Formula One engines for the likes of Lewis Hamilton. But what their expertise was, was not just specifically in Formula One, it was precision engineering. And they thought they might be able to use that expertise to solve this problem of reverse engineering the whisper flow. So they drove down to UCL with their computer-aided design equipment, and they met with the team. And then within the first 100 hours, they came up with the first prototype of the 2020 version of the Whisper Flow, which was called the UCL Ventura. And they made sure that they reverse engineered it in a way that could be not only operated very simply, but also mass produced at scale, and so their Northamptonshire site started churning out these machines very rapidly at a rate of 1,000 per day. And then after doing that, how did they turn this into money? Well, they didn't. Right? Having discovered the secret to make this life-saving machine, what they did was they gave away the blueprint of how to make the UCL Ventura, to 1,300 teams in 25 countries around the world to ensure that they could also make this device for patients suffering from COVID. So why am I explaining this story to you? It's because I'd like you to focus on these two questions. First is how did Mercedes involvement in the UCL Ventura improve its ESG scores? And the second, is what reputational hit would have Mercedes have suffered had it not been involved in UCL Ventura? Now, the answer to these questions is nothing and nothing. And so this is why my view of ESG might differ from what we typically hear. Well, often we think that ESG is the answer to these questions. It's about doing no harm. Often as investors, we think ESG is about risk management. Let's avoid some potential scandal from say workplace unrest or fake bank accounts like we had with Wells Fargo. And often we think again that ESG, why we do this is in order to avoid having downgrades through doing some harm in a particular area. Now, please don't get me wrong, Ryan, I do believe that part of ESG is indeed not to do any harm. However, what I want to do is shift our thinking and to say that ESG is much more about actively doing good, doing things like what Mercedes did. Right? Had it not bothered to get involved in UCL Ventura, there would have been no reputational hits. 
But if you are a truly responsible company, you need to actively create value for society. You need to do things for intrinsic reasons, not instrumental reasons. And that ties to the main violation of Milton Friedman, which I highlighted in my first um, section. Right, so if indeed you're only doing these things for instrumental reasons, to ensure that you don't suffer losses, you're only going to do these things that are publicly observable, that will show up in ESG scores. However, if your goal is to actively create value for society in an intrinsic way, then we need to change our thinking from ESG, from just doing no harm, to actively doing good. And so why is that my view of what ESG should be about? First, there's the moral and ethical case, which is right now in 2021, it's just not enough for a company to do no harm. Yes, it's good if you're not mistreating your workers or underpaying your taxes or polluting the environment, but you need to actively do good and solve the social problems of our time. But as a finance professor, well, I want to go beyond just the business, the moral and ethical case and highlight the business and financial case. Why is that important? It's because, right, if we only have the moral and ethical case, it might be that ESG will always be secondary to a CEO and an investor. So what is the financial case for ESG? It is the following. So I'm going to introduce the framework that I developed in the book that uh, Phil mentioned at the start. So we often think that the value that a company creates is given by a pie. And that pie can be split either between investors in the form of profits, or society in the form of taxes to the government, wages to workers, or fair prices to customers. And we often think that ESG is about splitting the pie more fair, doing no harm, making sure that we don't underpay tax, we don't pollute the environment, we don't price gouge customers. And again, please don't get me wrong, ESG and responsibility is absolutely about not doing harm, but it can't just be about for two reasons. The first reason is if ESG is just about splitting the pie differently, then it's bad for the company's profits. And therefore many CEOs might not voluntarily want to do this. Indeed, we saw two years ago, 181 CEOs sign the business roundtable statement claiming they're gonna serve society, but many of them actually didn't really put it into practice. And why would they? Right, because if ESG is something that makes your company less profitable, then let's just say some nice things and not put it into practice. And the second reason is that ESG can't just be about splitting the buy differently because it's bad for investors. Now, many people think, I don't care. They like to portray investors as nameless, faceless capitalists. Investors are them, society is us, and if we can take from them and give to us, then everybody's going to be better off. But I don't need to tell this audience, with a lot of distinguished investors in the audience, that investors are not them. They are us. They include parents saving for their children's education, pension funds saving for retirement, university endowments funding future teaching and research. So any repurposing of business absolutely needs to take investors seriously Profits and long-term returns are a key part of a purposeful economy. So this is why my view of ESG is that it's about growing the pie. So we do want to actively create value. We do want to increase the orange. But the way we serve society is not by giving them a greater slice of what's already there. It's not just through redistribution. It's through innovation and excellence, actively creating value, perhaps doing some crazy ideas like resurrecting a 1990s device and bringing it forward to 2020. And the beauty of this is that if you do this for intrinsic reasons, just to serve society, ultimately, you might be able to benefit. Why? It might be that employee motivation at Mercedes soars. It might be that they end up being able to attract much better employees in the future. It might be that customers are attracted to a company which in the pandemic helped out even though it didn't need to. So this point of my talk, or over halfway in, you might think, well, everything I say sounds good, but where's the evidence? It sounds a bit like wishful thinking. I'm saying, let's go beyond treatment. Let's do things for intrinsic, not instrumental reasons. Let's actively do good rather than just do no harm. 
and then magically some profits will appear down the line. But where's the evidence for that? Right? It almost seems too good to be true. So this is why my role and the role of many other academics on this call is to make sure that we don't just have a nice story, but large scale evidence, because how do you know that I didn't just handpick one nice example? The really important thing about evidence is to be really careful because of confirmation bias. That's the fact that we are tempted to accept a study or a finding if the conclusion confirms what we would like to be true. And that's especially a problem with ESG investing, right? because everybody would like to believe that ethical companies perform better. So if there was a flimsy study claiming that, everybody would still latch onto it because they like the fund. And so indeed the TED talk that uh, Phil mentioned, what to trust in a post-truth world, was about how we need to be really rigorous about evidence, particularly if it's on something where we have strong views. So let me now look at well how I decided to look at this myself in a paper I wrote about 15 years ago. I wanted to look at, does ES pay off? Right, we've got a lot of papers on governance, which I'm sure many of you know, so I'm going to focus on the E and the S. Or is it that companies that prioritise the E and S are just fluffy companies distracted from the bottom line? Now, the key question is how do we measure how well a company treats wider society? Now, this common approach might be to look at how much you spend. Do you put your money where your mouth is? How much do you pay your workers? How much do you know donate to charity? But that's problematic because it measures only the input, not the output. It could be that you're spending, but back to my first part, you're not spending in areas that you have comparative advantage in, so you're not actually creating value. And to look at this the other way, there's some great things that companies can do to serve society, which don't actually cost them a lot. So if you have a great boss who provides meaningful work and mentorship and opportunities to step up to her subordinates, that doesn't cost her anything, but it creates a lot of value. So what I wanted to do was to look at a measure of output, how much value a company actually creates to society, not the input, how much you spend. And so what I wanted to look at was how well a company treats its employees. Now you might think, well, why do I focus on employees? Why not customers or the environment and communities? Those are important, I'm gonna to come to those later. But the reason why I focused on employees was the issue of materiality. In nearly every single industry, employees are a critical stakeholder. Whereas the environment, yes, we all care passionately about climate change, but maybe in some industries, like tech, it's not as important as other issues, let's say data privacy or customer security and so on. But employees are really important in all organizations, so I wanted to focus on that. And the second reason was a data reason. I had a great data set for employee satisfaction, which was the list of the 100 best companies to work for in America. So why was that a great list? It looks thoroughly at the qualitative aspects of employee satisfaction, looking at 57 dimensions on areas such as credibility, respect, fairness, pride and camaraderie, not just quantitative factors like pay and benefits. But also it's important that I have that data from 1984. So why is that so key? Well, ESG is a pretty new topic, right? There's a lot of emphasis right now, but many data sets have only been around, let's say for the past 10 years. And if I show you that ESG paid off between 2010 and 2019, you might think, well, those were 10 great years for the stock market. Maybe ESG only works in an upswing. Maybe right now in a pandemic, we should just focus on profits. But because my data started in 1984, I had things like the financial crisis, like September the 11th and the collapse of the internet bubble. And so I could make sure that this was something that focused on both the bad times as well as the good times. Now there's obviously a lot of work I need to do to address correlation versus causation. Is it that employee satisfaction leads to better performance or is it that better performance allows a company to start treating its employees well? So I'm gonna refer you to the paper for how I try to address that. Instead, what I'm gonna do is focus on the results now because that's what matters most to practitioners. So what I found was that the 100 best companies to work for in America delivered shareholder returns that beat their peers by 2.3 to 3.8% per year 
over a 28 year period. So that's 89 to 184% cumulative. And so it's worth just pausing to highlight the significance of this result, right? So companies that are treating their work as well, they're not just giving part of the pie to employees at the expense of profits. They're growing the pie, the employees are becoming more motivated, more productive, and this is panning out in terms of long-term shelled returns. And then how do I link it to the dimensions of ESG that I started the talk with? This is about actively doing good. Well, there's other measures of ESG, which will look things at workplace unrest, labor strikes and disputes and injuries. Those things are not unimportant. But what I'm looking at is not the amount of harm you did, but the amount of active value creation. Because if your goal as a company was to avoid scandals, yes, you'd avoid these injuries and these strikes, but you wouldn't go above and beyond on things like pride and camaraderie and credibility. But what this shows is that actively do good, this does indeed lead to long-term profits, at least in the dimension of employee satisfaction. Now, what's the other big theme of what I'm saying? Is it, is it intrinsic or is it instrumental? So one pushback to me, might be maybe these companies were really savvy. Like when they chose to treat their employees well, they were really forward thinking and they knew that in the long term that they would have greater shareholder returns. So they did this purely from an instrumental calculation. Now, there's clearly no way to directly test that. Well, I can't get inside the heads of the managers. But what is really interesting is since then, there was a new study which looks at the exact same data set as me. And what they first did is they replicated the portfolio successfully, much of the results successfully for my 28 year period. But they also found the results continue to hold in the 10 years since then. And this is really striking, right? Because it highlights a huge market inefficiency. Typically, when an academic paper is published, then investors start jumping on the strategy and the returns are eroded over time. And you might think that will be particularly the case right now for an ESG type strategy, given there's so much attention paid to ESG. But in fact, it's not the case. The results still stayed strong. And so what that suggests is that people are actually not taking this into account. So the instrumental idea that people sort of know that this is a way of making higher profits is probably not what was driving the manager's decisions. Instead, I think these were companies who just thought treating our work as well is the right thing to do. And then ultimately in the long term, that led to higher shareholder performance, even though they could not foresee that from the outside. So let, let me now just expand beyond this and look at other dimensions of sustainability. And this is something some of you will maybe be familiar with, which is the materiality map of the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. And what this does is it goes industry by industry and highlights who are the most material stakeholders in your industry. So the first column here, extractives and minerals processing or mining. The environment is really important. If you are Rio Tinto and you blow up Duke and Gorge, that's going to be really bad for your business. But if I turn to financials, the environment is not so important in terms of an input. You're not really using raw materials. What does matter are things such as selling practices and product labeling. If you're a Wells Fargo and in a fake bank account scandal, that's going to be really bad for your business. So why do we care about that? It's because of what the data is suggesting. So this paper in a top accounting journal, what it did is it took the KLD database and it looked at companies that do well across the board. They do well on every ESG dimension. And what they found was that they don't beat the market. So the common claim that ESG always improves performance is not there in the data. They only beat the market by one and a half percent per year, which is insignificant. But then when they redid the study and they looked at companies that did well on the material issues, but scaled back on the immaterial ones, they did beat the market by 4.8% per year. And again, it's worth pausing to highlight the criticality of this result. So what it means is that to be a truly responsible company, we don't need to be all things to all people and tick every single box, but instead to focus on the couple of areas where we think that well, we are going to have the most impact and are actually most material to us in terms of the business. 
So my final five minutes, let me think about, well, how do we put this into practice? I could have looked at it from a company perspective, but I'm going to look at it from an investor's perspective. So historically, how people used to do ESG was divestment or exclusion, where you have a certain red line that a company cannot cross. And then if you do cross that red line, you're excluded. If you don't cross that red line, you're the admissible universe. And then people can select out of that admissible universe, looking at standard financial criteria. Now, there's a number of arguments for that. And one of these arguments is that we're going to deprive companies of capital. Let's try to sell these, say, energy companies in order to starve them of capital. But well, that doesn't really work, right? Because it's an obvious point, but the only reason that you aid that you can sell is if other investors buy. So you're not di di um, depriving any company of capital. Now, a more nuanced argument is that if you sell, you're driving the stock price down and therefore you're gonna make it hard for them to raise capital in the future. But many of these companies are old economy companies, which are not really in need of capital. A lot of them are actually returning capital back to their investors. So it's not clear that the whole idea of divestment is actually going to be quite effective. Now, there are other reasons why people might care about the stock price beyond just the cost of capital. The stock price does affect the value of managerial compensation. It's a signal to employees and so on. And so the whole idea is, well, maybe we're gonna divest and drive down the stock price to punish management. But that only works if the divestment is on a criteria that the management can control. So the whole idea of divesting from every fossil fuel company to punish these companies isn't gonna really work because if you're the manager of a fossil fuel company, you know that you're gonna be divested anyway, and therefore there's no incentive to have a clear decarbonization strategy. What is more effective is a tilting strategy where you might underweight the fossil fuel industry but if you are best in class, you're going to be helped. So why is this helpful? Right, because it gives you then the incentive as a fossil fuel CEO to be really best in class in terms of decarbonization, because it does mean that you'll be helped. And this is something I looked at over a decade ago. It's the idea of governance through exit. If you walk away from companies that are underperforming, that does improve managerial behavior, but it has to be that your exit decision is contingent upon something the manager can control. If you're going to be sold anyway, because you're being sold every, you're selling every fossil fuel company, that's not going to change any manager's behavior. But if it is contingent, then the manager does have incentives to improve her decarbonization. So what is the best approach that is currently used? It's one which is integration. And so what is this? This is incorporating ESG factors alongside financial factors. So rather than being seen as a foot in the door, where if you cross the red line, you're automatically out, it's instead something which is integrated at the same level as financial factors, where we're taking it into account. You don't actually automatically get kicked out if you, don't, if you cross the red line, but instead it's another consideration that we have alongside other factors like management quality. Now, people often ask me, well, if that's the case, well, what weight do we put on ESG versus finance? Is it 2080? Is it 1090 or 3070? But I think that's the wrong answer. Like we just take all of these things into account. And that might seem to be a bit of a cop out, but let's just say we're gonna do a completely financial analysis. What weight do we put on management quality versus historic financials versus industry outlook versus product mix? We don't have weights on them, but we just know how to take all of them into account. And what we're doing here with integration is we're expanding the set of firm characteristics to including these ESG factors because they're financial material. So what do some investors do? And I've just come off across often an investment committee meeting with Royal London, where I've served on their investment committee for six years. What we do is call a net benefit test. We ask ourselves, does the company provide a net benefit to society. So looking at all of the things it does, including the red lines that it crosses, but also the active value that it creates through doing things like Mercedes and Whisperflow, does the company overall create this value for society? Now, when I say this to many investors, they'll say, well, that's problematic because, well, that's clearly subjective. 
how can we measure this object? But this is the power. But if there was a fully objective measure of ESG, if there was complete harmony in ESG ratings, if there was one rating that everybody agreed was to be correct, then it would be priced in. And therefore no investor would be able to make money by trading on it. So the power of ESG investing is that it is subjective. Well, it's very difficult to understand this data. You need to take into account things like comparative advantage and things like materiality and things like excellence actively doing good, not doing no harm. And because investors do get this wrong, then it won't be fully priced in, which is why I think it is a great thing to look at for investors. It's something that can be financially material, but it's difficult for standard investors to look at. And this is why there's been such interest in ESG in the, historically, and I think it's going to be one of the key areas going forward. So that's all that I have uh, time for. Um, let me um, go hand back to um, Phil for questions. Okay, thanks, Alex. A very inspiring talk. And uh, again, if you haven't read Alex's book, Grow the Pie, what he talked about today is, is part of, you know, this is part of that, that book and it's, it's well worth reading. Uh, we got way too many questions for the last 10 minutes or so, but let me just read a few of them. Uh, Zahid Mubarak asks, the World Economic Forum suggests 21 core metrics and 34 expanded metrics to monitor ESG progress by companies. What is your opinion on those metrics and do you endorse them? Thanks very much, Sahih. So how do I answer that question? As an academic, I would look at the evidence. So what did the World Economic Forum say? So they started by saying, well, there's overwhelming evidence that ESG always outperforms. They had a footnote. I clicked on that footnote. I looked at the reference in the footnote. It's an article by Michael Porter. And the first line of the footnote was, despite countless studies, there has never been comprehensive evidence of outperformance. So the whole evidential underpinning of that World Economic Forum report is really suspect. One of the dimensions they look at is the CEO to worker pay ratio, where there's a lot of evidence showing that actually higher ratios are linked to higher shareholder returns, not lower. So I think the problem with that report is that the actual evidential um, underpinning of it is quite weak. But more generally, let's go beyond the specific dimension. So what do I think about this idea of having metrics? Certainly, having data is really, really useful. However, the problem is that many ESG dimensions are qualitative rather than quantitative, right? It could be that you provide high wages to your employees, but not great working conditions and meaningful work and skills development. So the problem with this quantitative approach to ESG is that there's many things that it might be missing out. So yes, we do want to try to measure what we can, but then as investors understand that when we're looking at these dimensions, there's also gonna be a lot of qualitative aspects that we do need to take into account. And I fear that some investors have too much of a mechanical, purely data-driven approach to something which is at least partly subjective. Great, I, and I, I, yeah, I suspect you're right on that. Uh, second question from Todd Haas, sounds like it's coming from an academic. Thanks for the remarks, Alex. Really appreciate them in your book broadly. In addition to confirmation bias, could you comment on survivorship concerns? Examples of companies prioritizing ESG and not only failing to grow the pie, but hurting businesses and uh, therefore shareholders and stakeholders. How large is that cohort? Yeah, thanks very much, Todd, for that question. And, and um, one example, and, and people might disagree with the example I'm going to be using, is Danone. So Danone with their CEO, Emmanuel Faber, they were said to be a fantastic ESG company. They were the first entreprise à mission in France, putting purpose in their articles of association. However, there were concerns that this was perhaps a mask for poor financial performance. And if you listen to the narrative, often people say well, there were pesky investors who were too short term as who kicked them out. But actually over six and a half years, which is not a short period of time, the company's stock price was flat when the rivals were about up about 50%. And even in terms of pure stakeholder performance, they had to have, have a lot of job losses because of the poor performance. So it can be the case that you can be too focused on ESG, particularly if you're looking at the immaterial dimensions and you're not actually delivering. And so it can be that companies do too much ESG. This is an agency problem sometimes where CEOs are doing things to improve their own image. And indeed, Professor Yang has one of her own papers in the room of financial studies showing that CEOs personally benefit from doing excessive ESG even though that does not benefit either shareholders or society. Okay, we have a, a question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, 
can an argument be made that a company isn't a living being, so it cannot therefore have intrinsic values to enact? Um, so the company isn't a, uh, yeah, so, so who is a company? Why a company can't have a purpose because a company is just a set of pe people, but the purpose is what the um, employees and the, the managers and the customers of the company are, are having. And so how does the company come up with a purpose? Right, you will have the employees and you're, you're going to have the, the, the executives, but also you might involve um, customers as well. So let me just give an example. The National Health Service in the UK, they have a purpose and that really matters. It's in the constitution, which is legally binding. And so when they try to come up with a purpose internally, they said it's to help people recover from illnesses, which kind of makes sense. But then when they decided to bring in their customers in the consultation, the customers said, we also care about having a decent death when the time came. And for a service so focused on wellness, they would have forgotten that had they not asked the, the customers. So what this means in terms of an answer to the question is yes, the company itself can't have a purpose, but the company which involves the people, which are the employees, the management and external stakeholders like customers or patients, they can have a purpose. And I think the companies that are most successful in having one are the ones where it's not just the C-suite that decides it, but they come up with it after an extensive consultation. Great answer. I'll have to remember that when I get similar questions in my classes. Uh, Deborah Dean asked, at COP26, UK Chancellor Rishi Sunak has just announced the complete rewiring of the entire global financial system for net zero. This smacks somewhat of the emperor's new clothes, but are companies and shareholders going to be happy with this mandated redirection of corporate strategy and presumably corporate governance? Yeah, so thanks very much, Deborah. So I haven't followed uh, what Rishi has said specifically at COP, but I certainly read very carefully the greening strategy that he announced just before that. And that has lots of self-congratulations, saying we're going to be directing company efforts and forcing companies to do this and that. I think all of this is pretty empty if the government itself does not use the most powerful tool that it has, which is a carbon tax, right? So we are here, many of us are economists, we understand the concept of externalities, and indeed the concept that I have of growing the pie, that only works if the actions you do to affect society ultimately do affect the company's profits in the long term. And so I think the most important thing that you need to do if you're the government is to internalize those externalities with a global carbon tax. I think also a problem with um, these uh, efforts that some um, governments are trying to do is really the devil is in the detail. So the Greening Finance Initiative follows the EU sustainable, um, uh, sorry, the EU taxonomy, which argues that you need to quantify how much of your portfolio is in climate change adaptation or mitigation. But that's really difficult because there's a lot of second and third order effects. So how do we look at a company like Zoom? Right. That might be involved in climate change adaptation because we don't need to travel. At Royal London, we put our entire portfolio through this warming tool, which looked at how much your portfolio contributes towards climate change. The worst offenders were semiconductor companies, because when you make semiconductors, you release perfluorocarbons to the atmosphere. And that's really bad for climate change. Yet semiconductors can be used to actually power solar panels so that can actually mitigate climate change. And so you have all of these great taxonomies, but not really taking these second order effects into account. And so the um, sort of overly prescriptive approach, which I think is inherent in Deborah's question, might only be focusing on some dimensions of your impact on the overall environment and ignoring really other important ones, such as Zoom's effect on reducing business travel or a semiconductor's effect on being used in solar panels. Let me throw in a question of my own. Uh... I was intrigued two years ago that uh, the Pfizer CEO announced that he was willing to spend a billion dollars to develop a COVID-19 vaccine, even if there was no necessary return on that. He said, we have the resources, we can survive a billion dollar loss. Does this fit into a similar example to your Mercedes example? I think on the one hand, it may well do. Why? Because it is used in the comparative advantage and expertise, which is um, for Pfizer, obviously, to, to develop a vaccine. 
But then I would be skeptical um, and say, well, why did he have to be so public about it and say something like $1 billion? You have the concern that Wei Zhang, who I believe is your next speaker in the series, is expressing in, in, in the Q&A, why are you, you might be doing this to virtue signal so that the CEO then is seen to be the savior of capitalism and can end up writing a lot of books about it. So I think some of the great companies, which genuinely do responsibility, they're doing this and then after the fact, they might end up reporting on it. But I wouldn't sort of pre-announce what you're doing before you've actually delivered any particular result, because then you have the concern that you're doing that for PR relations. I think the most responsible companies get on and do responsibly, get on and do responsibility rather than crowing about it, certainly before having actually delivered the results. Okay, great. Now, uh, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to uh, June, who will uh, do a summary and uh, tell us what's happening next with the uh, center. Uh, thank you, Phil. Thank you, Alex, very much for this uh, insightful and wonderful lecture on stakeholder versus shareholder capitalism. So what's the takeaway? Uh, when companies consider ESGs, we should consider incorporate ESG factors alongside financial factors. And when the board of directors is making decisions, uh, they should consider the comparative advantage and consider making material impacts on the society. So the true takeaway is the magic words here, uh, grow the pie, I really like the book. But today's lecture also left us with many more questions on ESGs. Some are raised uh, in the Q&A sessions. For example, what are the roles of governments and legal frameworks? Would there be too many regulations? And can we collaborate cross borders on important and global issues? How do we measure firms' ESG commitment, which is easy to make, their actions, and their performance, what are the real effects? And do we observe ESG innovation connect or disconnect in practice? And the last point Alex did touch on is how to do ESG investing or divesting? Would voice or exit be more effective? So these are important questions. Hopefully we're gonna have opportunity to discuss in greater detail. Beyond ESG, as technology advances, corporate boards are facing new challenges every day. For example, how do big data, artificial intelligence, and technology affect corporate governance? How to incorporate cybersecurity into companies' overall risk management strategy so data breaches become more or less the normal effect uh, we heard more and how do we incorporate that into our decisions? How to factor in climate risk and seek sustainable growth? And moreover, how should corporate board consider the regulatory intervention in current days, we do have plenty of them, and compliance issues? And how do we embrace and foster diversity? So the Institute for Corporate Governance uh, ICT at Cali, we host a whole series of public lectures. Alex is the inaugural lecturer and forums and seminars to facilitate the discussions and debates on these important governance related issues. We do thanks the ECGI and Oxfam workshop for co-hosting today's lecture and all the materials of today will be posted soon on ECGI's website and our, our website once it's uh, launched next week. Upcoming event, the next open lecture is governance, data, and technology. It will be provided by Professor Wei Jiang from Columbia University. She is an expert on shareholder activism. And more recently, she spent a lot of time studying the applications of big data, machine learning, and artificial intelligence on corporate governance. So more announcement will follow. For suggestions, and especially if you have any proposals to make contributions to these discussions, to participate in the future events, please feel free to contact me at my uh, Indiana email address. Thank you all uh, for participation. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Marco, Elaine, and Scott for your great support to make this event happen. 
Well, thanks so much, June. It's great to be here. And thank you to all the people asking asked questions. I understand we, we didn't get through all of them. So I will try and find a way just to type up some responses and then I can give it to June. Then it might be that we, yes. we can share this as a Q&A document to all the participants. Really appreciate all, all of the people's engagement. All right. Thank you all. Uh, that marks the end of today's event. You have a good day and good evening and see you soon in December. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye.